first scripture reading, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. Teach us his ways, and we may talk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So this is apocalyptic literature, and apocalyptic literature is meant to bring hope, to be hopeful. Despite the trials of the present age, a day is coming when all will be right as rain. Not like Noah rain that is referenced in this passage, but right as rain. And I looked that up. Uh, Henry and I were talking about uh, before the service. I'm, I'm a word Uh, geek. I love to know where things come from. So I looked it up. Where does that expression, right as rain, come from? (laughs) England, where it rains all the time. So it's just normal that, you know, it's just right as rain, right? It's a fact of life. What is also a fact of life is suffering. We believe that the gospel of Matthew was written after the fall of Jerusalem, uh, which was in the year 70, and the temple has been destroyed, and the people are left wrestling with the question, how could God have let this happen? We wrestle with that question as well. It's the root of the theological exploration called theodicy. Uh, Why, If God is almighty and benevolent, why does God allow for suffering? I'm not going to wrestle with that question for this sermon, the question of theodicy. Just want to acknowledge it. It looms above like a gray cloud that is full of rain, but today we also acknowledge that gray gray clouds do have silver linings. The liturgical season of Advent acknowledges that all is not right with the world, but it will be made right. We wait, Advent means coming or arriving, we wait for the coming Christ to come to put everything the way it should be. But the question is, how do we wait? The passages that follow this passage that we read in Matthew answer that question. Uh, The headings, which are, you know, you know, they're not in scripture, but they're given by scholars. Are, the headings are the faithful or the unfaithful slave, the parable of the ten bridesmaids, the peril of the talents, the judgment of the nations, which is the separation of sheep and goats. If you are familiar with those passages, then you know that the answer to how do we wait is to get busy. How do we get busy? 
You might ask, that's a great question, and we'll come back to it. But let's pause and ponder what your reaction would be if Jesus told you, I'm coming to your house today. What's the first thought that comes into your head, or what is the feeling? Panic, dread, joy. Because there's no hiding from Jesus. He knows how much you have it together and how much you're faking it. Will he condemn you, judge you harshly? Will you be apologizing constantly and wringing your hands? <laughs> or will you understand Jesus to be that friend for whom you don't have to pretend? He accepts you as you are and you know, he will bless the mess. But he will also speak the truth. And Jesus, the truth that Jesus speaks will always be spoken in love. It is true that love breaks our hearts again and again because suffering is a part of life, because we love, because when the ones that we love suffer, we suffer with. So too with Jesus, who suffers when the ones that he loves suffers. And so he calls us to love on those whom he loves. That's what we do while we're waiting. Matthew 25, to feed folks who are hungry, to give drink to those who are thirsty, to clothe those who are naked, to visit those who are sick or in prison. Jesus tells us in Matthew 25 what we're supposed to do while we're waiting. To make things right as rain for other people. I listened to a, a podcast this week. I like Brene Brown a lot, and she had an interview with famous singer and activist Bono from the group U2. And he reminded the listeners that our Savior was born in muck and squalor. <laughs> he didn't say muck. He used another word. But in church, I'm going to say muck. <laughs> but the fact that our Savior came to us in muck and squalor tells us everything that we need, need to know about the nature of our God. The goal of Advent, or all of our lives, really, as followers of Jesus Christ, is to incarnate, to bring flesh to the living God, to the muck, in the muck and the squalor of this world. So the truth spoken in love. How we choose to celebrate Christmas in this country is not usually an incarnation of Christ. In fact, the way that our culture celebrates Christmas does not honor the values of the one whom we are honoring. We tend to buy presents for people who already have everything that they need. We create mythical stories of abundant generosity that can cause people to go into debt. And you know, you know what, who I'm talking about, right? And people who perpetuate the myth, I, I'd like to offer a consejo, a suggestion. And I did not come up with this. But the, the big guy who, who says ho, 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 brings one present. Because, and um, these little things have changed the world. So kids on Christmas morning take pictures of all that they got and they post it for their friends. And there's a huge question mark as to why the kid who has everything got all this when the kid who has almost nothing got socks and underwear. So these have changed everything we need to change. So that's a suggestion that I did not come up with that's been online for years. When years ago I told my kids that Jesus got three pe presents, we were going to go down to three presents, I was not very popular in my house. And my kids said to me, you know, most of the time, I'm proud that you're a pastor. <laughs> and I don't mind being the child of a pastor. But in this instance, it stinks. And they didn't use the word stinks. <laughs> It was, it was not a great evangelistic tool for my kids. Uh, and by the way, one of those gifts was always a doozy, so they were not deprived. I have a friend, a uh, pastor friend, who he said, we, we tend to, you know, what we tend to do is, is treat Christmas like it's our birthdays. Um, 
he, they make a much bigger deal about their kids' birthdays. Whoo, go to town. And Christmas is Jesus' birthday. And they honor him by doing things that, that they think honor the values of Christ our Savior. And, um, you know, and the gifts that they give are homemade. And this is, you know, and by the way, I'm always preaching to myself when, when, I, when I do these things. I'm in, I'm in the, the wrestling with everybody else. But the gift to do something with one another, to give the gift of experience, uh, to create something together, bake cookies, build a birdhouse, go to a museum, take a hike. There's a thousand things. Create a memory uh, more than than buy stuff. You know, the money we spend on Christmas every year, if we direct we redirected it, there wouldn't be a per, there there would not be a water issue across the world. We could use that money to to make sure that everyone has potable water. Uh, Americans spent, and in the you know in the last two years when people you know in 2020. When we, you know, when people lost their jobs and and uh, or had no income coming in, spending for Christmas went up 58.7 billion. Last year it went up 109 billion, for a total of 886.7 billion dollars we spent in just in the U.S. And I read and I read that Canada, uh, the Canadians spend double. We spend over a trillion dollars across the world on Christmas. What could we accomplish if we put our minds and our hearts? Uh, to celebrate, to honor Christ the way Christ would have us. And by the way, I normally try to, to, to do this sermon before Black Friday. It didn't happen this year. Uh, but uh, my son and I were talking in the car, and we were talking Black Friday, and Saturday is Small Business Saturday. I don't know what Sunday is. Uh, Monday is Cyber Monday, right? And then I said, and Tuesday is Giving Tuesday. And he goes, I've never heard of that. I said, well, you're not the head of a nonprofit. Tuesday is, is Giving Tuesday. So um, give to bring hope to those who need the necessities so that we might know peace and joy when we embody love. That's a lovely choreography of Advent, to live into hope so that we might know peace and joy all born out of this great love. My family watched a movie the other night about the end of the world. All these, you know, going into Advent apocalyptic literature, and it just pops up everywhere, my goodness. But it was really a call to take climate change seriously, and it did shake me, hopefully awake. And I confess that I have already bought Christmas presents, and there's a theme of of buying products to hopefully get uh, people... uh, psyched about using products that are good for the environment and don't have plastic packaging. Anyway, at the end of this movie, when they're sitting waiting for the destruction, the main characters sat at the table and shared what they were thankful for. And one said that we tried to help everyone understand and change, that we tried. And I thought, yeah, yeah. That's a life well lived. We're called to try each and every day to pour ourselves out in love to the world and then do it again tomorrow and the day after and every day. The price of love are hugs and tears. Love well in the name of Jesus. Amen.